makes preaching easy, that the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in the only place it matters, in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength, our rock, our salvation, and our redeemer, that those who know and love the Lord say, amen. amen. turn our attention to a familiar passage of scripture in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. The first 13 verses. Here and we find these words, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those 40 days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, what's that next word? What's that next word? The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, Tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. Some translations continue that to say, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple, and what's that next word? If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. May the Lord add a rich blessing and understanding to the reading, hearing, and living of his holy word. Amen. Now, the way the language begins in chapter 4, it is clearly a continuation for something that has happened previously. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. So clearly there must be some reference to this Holy Spirit filling him, to him being at the Jordan. And then he is driven into the wilderness and tempted by the devil. We look in chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, and we see what the Bible says. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. So that Jesus at this point had not yet begun his earthly ministry, he goes to be baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And when he comes up out of the water, he hears from the Lord. The Lord has a, a word for him to uh, affirm him, to, to let him know that, that God has him, that he is living his life in God's purpose and in God's will, that God is pleased with him, that God loves him. And so we see there uh, in verses 22, in verse uh, 20. Uh, Two, yes, 
that, that God tells them, first of all, that there is uh, ownership, there is relationship, there is kinship. You are my son. I, I love you. I am well pleased with you. But the other thing that jumps out to me from this passage is that it says, as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him. That even though he was in the midst of this ceremony, of this uh, uh, baptism, that uh, there were a whole lot of other folk around, that Jesus took the time uh, in the midst of ceremony, in the midst of tradition, in the midst of what everybody else was doing, Jesus took the time to have a solitary moment with the Lord. And he prayed. Y'all need to hold on to that. When you come to church on Sunday morning, sometimes you have to just uh, uh, disconnect for a minute from, from the people around you, from the conversations that people might be trying to have around you or with you. I, uh, I'm going to just tell y'all now, and maybe the folks who uh, sit near you, they're trying to be too polite to tell you, they don't want to tell you to shut up in the middle of church, but if you are sitting next to somebody trying to talk to them while they are trying to have a conversation with the Lord, you need to stop talking. They didn't come here to hear you. They came here to talk to the Lord, to hear from the Lord. If you are sitting behind somebody or in front of somebody having a conversation, we can still hear you. Be quiet. We're not here to hear you. We're here to hear from the Lord. So, so, so Jesus then takes the time. Y'all need to take the time that when you are in uh, God's house, when you are here for worship and for praise, that you just take a moment just to talk to the Lord, just to thank him, just to thank him for waking you up, to thank him for blessing you, to thank him for keeping you, to thank him for having a purpose and plan for your life, to thank him for everything he's done already, to thank him for all the storms and trials he's already brought you through, to thank you for the hint, thank him for the healing that's already come, to thank him for deliverance that's already come, to thank him just for being your God and choosing Choosing to love you, that you thank him. And so Jesus paused in the middle of this ceremony, in the middle of baptism. Sometimes we need to pause in the middle of church just to disconnect from everybody around us and connect with the one who made us and the one who keeps us and the one who has a plan for us and talk to the Lord. And what happens when he goes to the Lord in prayer, something happened. Y'all know that when you pray, things happen. So Jesus prayed and something happened. What happened? It said that heaven opened. And the spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And then he hears from God. You are my son. I love you. In you I am well pleased that must have been a high moment for Jesus even as he is the son of God and he knows who he is that still must have been a, a, a high time for him an exciting time but what happened next the spirit it said the same spirit that descended on him, the same spirit that conveyed God's acceptance and God's blessing and God's love and God's purpose for him, that spirit drove him into the wilderness. Understand, family, that even when you have had a high moment in God, when you have had a high moment in worship, in praise, in prayer, in meditation, in conversation, that that doesn't mean that everything going to get smooth from there. Have I got a witness? Uh, that, that sometimes when you get close to God, you closer closer to God just in the nick of time because then all hell breaks loose. So don't think because you're connected, you feel just so, oh, so close right now that it's going to be all smooth sailing, all good from here. But know that some trials may come. But understand that whatever is coming, 
God will give you what you need to handle it and to make it through. So, so let's look in chapter 4 at what happens. God has now, uh, the, the Spirit has driven Jesus into the wilderness. For 40 days and for 40 nights, he's been tempted by the devil. The Word doesn't tell us what the devil has been telling him all this time, but we do know that whatever the devil was telling him, it was a lie. How do we know that? Because in John chapter 10, I believe it is, it says, or John 8, John 8, 44, let me check that. I want to make sure so you have the right text, that the devil is a liar. And when he speaks, he is speaking his native language, for he is the father of lies. Yes, John 8, 44, the devil, uh, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, but there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks of native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He is the originator of lies. He don't know truth. He can't speak truth. When the devil speaks, it's a lie. That's what happens to some of us when we're in a dark place, when we're going through the valley, when we're having some suffering, when we're going through some depression, that the, the adversary will use that moment of weakness, that moment of suffering to speak something into your spirit. Understand that whatever the devil tells you, it is a lie, number one. It is designed to cause you to act in a manner that is contrary to God's purpose for you, number two. And number three, it is designed to take you out. Let me say that again. If the devil is talking to you, and you will know that it's the devil because whatever you're hearing does not glorify God. For those of you who have ever uh, considered suicide or ever attempted suicide, that when you started hearing some things in your spirit, you know life is just hopeless. You know God doesn't love you. That Jesus thing ain't real. Why don't you just go ahead and end it all? Understand right there that the God of creation would not have knit you together in your mama's womb, have a purpose and a plan for your life, and then tell you to take your life. So that when he speaks, he's lying. Whatever he says, we can't believe it. We can't accept it. That in addition to lying, when he speaks, it's designed to separate you from your purpose in God, and it is designed to destroy you and take you out. So something was going on out there in the wilderness, in the desert, for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, whatever had happened, the devil clearly had not yet been successful because at the end of 40 days, then Jesus and the devil are, are, are still wrestling. Jesus did not realize, I don't guess, that it was almost the end of the trial, but maybe the devil is now trying his last final gambit, his last appeal. And so what does he say? The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. A couple of thoughts on if. The first, if you turn to James, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just referencing it for you. James chapter 2, somewhere around verse 18, when it says, you believe, and there it's talking about the whole thing with faith without works is dead, but it says that you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder, that the demons know that God is real. The demons know that God has power. The demons know that God has, is sovereign. The demons know that God's in control. You believe that there's one God? Congratulations. Even the devil does. So the devil knew he was the son of God. That's why he was with him in the desert for 40 days trying to tempt him. He was trying to get him off his task, off his mission. If you are the son of God, sucker, you know who I am. If you are the son of God, I know you're hungry. Turn these stones into some bread. It was the first temptation, what he's trying to, or the first temptation that is recorded. And what he's trying to do there is to get him to succumb to a personal or physical need or desire. Understand that when temptation comes, the devil will awful, often tempt you with things that will satisfy or at least will present the image, the appearance of satisfying you of a personal or physical need or desire. You're hungry. 
And I, I, I know you have power. I'm saying if you're the son of God, but I know you're the son of God because I just said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. He was trying to get him to misuse and misappropriate his power and his authority to meet a personal need. Jesus comes back at him. It is written, man does not live by bread alone. Quoting from Deuteronomy 8 and 3, and then going beyond that, as I say, some translations say, but only what proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil led him, and this second temptation, we're going to park there for a minute because this is where it gets into the crux of what the devil wants to do in your life. The devil led him to a high place, showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Now, some of us will look at that and say, well, now the Lord has given the devil a whole lot of power and authority and dominion and stuff. How are we supposed to compete against all that? I'm so glad you asked. There is a translation that is significant here. When the devil, uh, when it talks about power, uh, exousia is the word in the Greek that's used. And one of the meanings uh, attached to this exousia for the power is the word permission. Just say that, permission. So what that is telling us is that God has given the devil permission within certain boundaries to do certain things. So that God has given him permission in a small realm, and that's the realm we, we, we live in. But understand, God is still sovereign. The, the adversary is not. And he still has to ask permission. God granted permission for him to have some authority. Just say that word, some. Some authority in this realm, in this earth realm. And so Satan is basically trying to sucker Jesus in because, again, what is the thing we need to remember about the devil if nothing else he is a? Right. So, again, if his lips are moving, like Dick Cheney, if his lips are moving, he's lying. Okay, let me leave Dick alone. But if his lips are moving, he's lying. Huh? So he tells him, okay, I've got all this authority that God has given me permission. And he says, it's been given to me. I can give it to anyone I want to. And here's the thing, verse 7. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Other translations talk about glory. The word glory comes up in there because that's what Satan wants from you. He wants your worship. He wants your worship that will be a misdirection of the worship and glory that is due to God, and he wants it instead. Glory, doxa in the Greek, is uh, where we recognize a person or a thing for what it is, the recognition belonging to a person, so that glory belongs to God. Worship belongs to God. Praise belongs to God. The enemy is trying to get Jesus to redirect, to misdirect the worship that is due to God, the praise that is due to God, the glory that is due to God, to give him something that he's already got control over anyway. You don't believe me? Turn to Colossians chapter 1. See, the devil is trying to sucker Jesus into giving him, the devil, worship so that then he, he uh, uh, misdirects his power and his purpose so that he can then have something that he already has. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and following. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. 
all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the church, the body, the church, etc. But you hear that all things were created by him and for him, and he's before him, and in all things in him they hold together. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he, Jesus, the Word was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Nothing that was made was made without him. Nothing without him was made that has been been made. That's what the Bible says. So what the devil is trying to get Jesus to do is give him worship and glory so that he can then have temporary control in subjection to a defeated devil and surrender, therefore, his permanent control and dominion that God has already given him. What does that mean for you? What that means for you is that God already has a plan, a purpose, a design for your life greater than you can imagine. I have come, Jesus said, John 10, 10, that you may have life and have it what? More abundantly, super abundantly. But if we get it twisted, and give our worship and give glory, give recognition to the devil that belongs to God, we will undercut, we will hamper, we will damage, we might destroy God's plan and purpose for our lives. I hope I'm helping somebody today. Are, are you with me? So, so, so what he's trying to do is like, okay, I couldn't get you to meet your physical need, turn breads into stone. I guess you're like, dude, I've been out here 40 days. I can last 41, whatever. Okay, fine. Now let me uh, hang some baubles in front of you, little, some jewels, and, and just see the kingdoms of the world, and it can all be yours. Dude, it's already mine. If you could only recognize, if we could only recognize and appreciate how special we are to God. Psalm 8, who is man? What, who, what is, oh, come on, come on, come on. Who are you? Come on, somebody help me out. You are mindful of him, thank you. The son of man. So I always say the Lord always has a ram in the bush. The son of man that you care for him. But you made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. That if you just knew how special you were, how anointed you can be, how gifted you can be, how much you can accomplish for God's will and God's glory, if we don't get stuck on stupid, yield to our flesh, get stuck on stupid, chase after stuff that God, who has cattle on a thousand hills, will give us anyway according to our need, if we don't get stuck on the things of this world, things that we can't keep. My mother was talking the other day about uh, a couple of my cousins and an aunt and talking about them and money and how they, you know, they're always trying to make sure they got enough money. Now, my aunt's like 83 years old. Now, she's in great shape. She might live another 30 years, the shape she's in, but eventually, the Lord going to call her, what you going to do with the money then? You know? We hold on to stuff or chase after stuff or yearn after stuff, and God says, I will provide for all your needs according to my riches and glory. So he's trying to get it. Here, do this. Do this and I'll give you that. I've already got that. When the devil tries to tell you that, it's like, you know what, devil, I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm going to just stick with the Lord and see what the Lord does. Because the Lord has never let me down so far. Even when I messed up, God was there. Even when I was in the hospital, God was there. Even when I thought I was losing my mind, God was there. Even when I was in prison, God was there. Wherever I was, whatever I was going through, God kept me. And God fixed it. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. I feel like preaching this morning. So then the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And then he goes with that if word again. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. 
And then what does the devil do? He starts quoting scripture. But understand that when the devil quotes scripture, even though he's quoting God's word, he's still lying because he is misappropriating the purpose of the scripture. He said, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you that they will lift you up in their hands so that you won't strike your foot against the stone. Therefore, you can jump off the highest point in the temple because God said he would do this. And Jesus said, uh, yeah, but it says don't put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, that we're not going to tempt God. We're not going to test God doing something foolish and stupid that's unnecessary so that God may do that. No, 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 no. Now, when Daniel, and, and, uh, when Daniel went into the lion's den, okay, he was in God's mission, God's purpose. So what did God do? He closed the lion's mouths. When the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach and Meshach and a bad Negro, when they went into the fiery furnace, what did God do? They were in there on God's mission, God's assignment, so, so that the furnace was seven times higher. Hotter, heated seven times hotter. The people who threw them in the furnace burned up. They were in there walking around and they had some company. The king looked in there and said, how many did we throw in there? Three. Well, now I see four and the fourth looks like a son of God. That when you're in God's assignment and God's will, God will provide some miraculous blessing and keeping for you. But you don't tempt or test God doing nothing stupid. And so Jesus corrected him again. And so then what does the Bible say in verse 13? When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him. Whew. We're done. It's all good. That's what it says, right? When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him. And that's it. What does it say? For a season until an opportune time. That even though he's the son of God who had withstood major temptation for 40 days and then these three uh, temptations that are recorded here in the book, he's coming back again. So that we always have to be vigilant, always have to be ready. But there's a scripture in uh, uh, James chapter 4, I think it's around verse 2, that says, uh, if you submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee. What happened? Jesus was submitted to God, he resisted the devil, and the devil tried his tempting, and then he rolled out because he was not successful. In the same way, you who are sons and daughters of the Most High God, if you submit to God, and resist the devil. He must. Just say that word must. Doesn't say maybe, doesn't say perhaps, doesn't say if he feels like it. If you submit to God and resist the devil, he must flee. Ah. So he left him until an opportune time. That lets us know he's coming back. But now, so again, Jesus ought to be feeling pretty good after he got something to eat. He's like, okay, well, I withstood the devil. I got baptized, heaven opened, spirit came down. Now I've withstood the devil. Now I can get something to eat in the shower. I'm good. Now let me go on into ministry. It should be smooth sailing from here. I don't think so. And what happens next? Even when you're walking in God's purpose, even when you're walking in God's anointing, even when you've been faithful, some of this stuff might happen to you. What's the first thing that happened? Jesus faced rejection. In Luke 14, he goes to minister in Nazareth. He proclaims, he reads the, from the scroll in the temple, in the, in the synagogue, and the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, said, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. But then somebody said, isn't, this, isn't that Joseph's boy? Isn't that Joseph's son? Joseph and Mary, don't they live right around yonder? Don't we know his brothers and his sister? Who does he think he is? Talking about that today is fulfilled in your hearing. And so what the Bible tells us in some other places is that he was only able to do a few miracles in his own hometown, people that he'd grown up knowing, people that he wanted to bless because they were rejecting him because they knew who he was and where he was from. Understand that even when the Lord does something special in your life, when the Lord saves you, when the Lord heals you, when the Lord empowers you, when the Lord redeems you, when the Lord calls you, understand that them folk that have known you win, the folk you used to get high with, the whore around with, the gamble with, 
with or run the streets with, they're not going to embrace the new you. And you might get rejected. So he faced rejection. Then the next thing was challenge to his authority. Verses 31 to 37, he goes down to Capernaum, town in Galilee. The people were amazed at his teaching down there, praise God. And then he's in the synagogue, and somebody comes with a, a spirit, and he speaks to it and says, come out of him. And the demon comes out. And all of the people were amazed and said to each other, what is this teaching with authority and power? He gives already uh, orders to evil spirits, and they come out. And news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So some of the healing he wanted to do in Nazareth that they wouldn't let him do because they knew him, he's now doing in Capernaum because people perceive that he had authority. Beloved, when God brings you through something, there will be an air of authority about you. There will be an air of legitimacy about you, that you will be too legit to quit, that this is going to be something so real about you because you've been with the Lord and what God has done for you that people won't be able to do anything but give praise to God. And then he went on to heal many demons, it said. And then he went on after he healed all of these demons. The Bible says that he went to a solitary place to pray after he'd done all the healing. Even the Son of God had to stay connected. Even the Son of God had to refuel. Even the Son of God had to stay uh, 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 connected to his purpose. Even the Son of God had to take some time in a quiet place to hear from the Lord and to pray. And we talked last week about the value of silence and taking time alone with God. And, and I thank uh, uh, it'll come to me in a minute, but I remember what she told me. No, I remember, it's just your name's not coming in me now. I've known you for nine years, the name's not coming. I don't know what this is, I don't appreciate it. I have to get some ginkgo or something. <laughs> Help me out. Jocelyn, Jocelyn Thomas, thank you. Jocelyn pointed out, because we were talking last week about silence, that the same, less, same letters in the word silent are used for the word listen. That went over your head. I'll say it again. <laughs> the same letters in the word silent or in the word listen. So that when we are silent before God, we take time to connect to and hear from God. When we are listening, the Lord will speak. And he will give you what you need. So I urge you to walk in the fullness of the authority and the blessing God has given you. He has called you to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. You are the king's kids. You have authority. You are the king's kids. Don't get it twisted and misuse the authority or get suckered into letting the adversary pull you away from the purpose that God has intended for you. But understand that the Lord will call you, the Lord will anoint you, the Lord will bless you, the Lord will speak to you, but the Lord will allow you to go through trial and temptation and tribulation, but the Lord will be with you in the trial, temptation and tribulation so that when you submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee, but after you've been anointed and you've withstood that test and you come out and you're fired up and ready to go, then you're going to come to some people who might reject you because they remember when. And so what you do then is you pray for them, you shake the dust off your shoes, and you keep it moving. How many of us have, have, have under, undermined God's purpose for us because we got stuck on what people had to say about us? 
Well, Sandy, I'm trying to, I'm trying to engage in this ministry, and Sandy's not feeling me because she keeps reminding me that, you know, she was my first girlfriend back in the day, and there's some things that she knows that I hope she didn't tell nobody else, but, but she just keeps reminding me of that. So I, I don't even want to hear. I got to tell you when I, no, I'm not going to tell that story. Um, well, I'll tell some and I'll keep some. My girlfriend in college, when we finished, you know, we finished college. She went on to law school. I was still in the D.C. metro area. And it was in that interim that I had received my calling from the Lord. And so I'm heading in a different direction. And then she came home for spring break. See, and, uh, uh, Shirley's already shaking her head. She's like, uh-oh, that's <laughs> trouble. Uh-huh. And we're just catching up, talking about life and what's been going on. And when I mentioned that the Lord had called me into ministry, that I was feeling a calling on my life to ministry and that I was going to try to be celibate, that I, I was being celibate until she got home from spring break. <laughs> And she kind of chuckled, because I guess she remembered college. Lord have mercy. <laughs> that people will remind you of your past or try and pull you back into understand yeah, what you used to do. That's right. After spring break, I ain't see her no more. Why? <laughs> you wonder why. Oh. <laughs> Don't mess with me. That even after God has called you, even after God has brought you through, that you still might go through some things, that you might face rejection. Do not let what other folks say deter you from your purpose and your calling. Huh? The, really? So Bruce don't like me, and so I'm going to get depressed, and oh, well, I can't do anything because I, I, I haven't won him over. Forget Bruce. Yeah. Let the Lord deal with Bruce. And you go on and do what God said to do. And remember to spend time with the Lord in silence so that you can hear from him. Continue in his anointing, continue in his blessing, continue in his purpose. He will remind you that he said, you are my son, my daughter, whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. He will remind you that when you spoke with him, that the heavens opened, that the spirit came down. He will remind you of all of the power and authority he gave you and say, do not get stuck on rejection, on other people, on folk that want to remind you of when, but just go ahead. Don't look to the left or the right. And I will bless you and anoint you and use you for my glory. God has called us, family, to be servants of the Most High God, to serve him. That's why we're here. We are called, we are saved to serve. Let the Lord use you and fill you and serve him until you're all used up. Last thought, and then I'm through. I was talking to Pastor Menendez the other day who's still dealing with some surgeries here and there. She's doing better, but a lot of pain and whatever going with it. And as we were talking, she said that she wants to die empty. Y'all yeah. know what that means? She don't want to leave anything right. on the table. Right. They use that analogy in sports. They'll say they left it all on the court. They left it all on the field. If they didn't use it all on the court and the game's over, it don't matter now. If you didn't use it all on the field, the game's over, too late. Yeah. That we want to die empty that we will let God use us. And as long as the Lord still has purpose for us, he will keep in that quiet time, in that silent time, in that listening time, he will keep refilling us for the assignment. But eventually, 
when we're ready to get up out of here. And I ain't in no rush, but I ain't trying to stay here forever. Keep having these discussions with my wife. She kept telling me she wants 50 or 60 years. I said, girl, you know how old I am? You want me to live to be 103 in this world? Really? I want 50 years. 102. I, Ain't nothing here I want to stay here for for 102 years. Huh? Well, I'll see y'all when you get there. You know? Now, you know, I, I'm going to put in as much time as I can. You know, I, I swim, so I, you know, stay around in as good a shape as possible. But eventually, no matter what we've done to try and stay here and eat well and stay in whatever kind of shape, no one leaves this world alive. <laughs> Just let that sink in. Nobody leaves this world alive. And the only way to get to eternity, to get to heaven, unless the Lord cracks the sky and comes back, unless the rapture comes, the only way to get to heaven, we got to die and leave here. Now, I ain't in no rush. Uh, I'll try and give you at least 40, and then we'll discuss it after that. But the Lord will fill you and fill you and fill you and you will pour it out and pour it out and pour it out. And then one day we hope and pray that we have done all that we can do in the name of the Lord and we can be empty and the Lord will call us home. Go and serve the Lord in all that you do. Serve him with power, serve him with joy, serve him with gladness, serve him with zeal, serve him with energy. Know that he'll give you everything.